Hello, Jeff here again. This week's Peterborough mini lecture focuses on Peterborough's canals and Peterborough County and the surrounding areas canals and their legacy. To ensure we are all on the same page, it probably makes some sense to define what do I mean by a canal. In this instance, a canal is going to refer to a waterway that is either completely built by people or a natural waterway that has been heavily modified or a combination of the two so that it will have a relatively constant depth and straight travel lines, or at least for most of its way or for large sections of its, of its path, it will have relatively straight travel lines. And it is designed usually for some combination of irrigation, shipping, or flood control. In the case of Peterborough in the surrounding areas canals, they are designed largely for shipping purposes or were designed largely for shipping purposes. One of the features of canal systems is that they will often have locks, which you might think of as sort of doors or even vaguely like an airlock. So it is a, a, a lock is a mechanism for going either uphill or downhill. So if there's a change in elevation, a ship will move into the lock. Uh, the, and a lock will have a basically a front door and a back door. It will move, a ship will move into a lock, the back door will close, and then the water level will then either increase or decrease to match the level of the water on the side of the front door. Water will then be, so as after the water is either pumped in or removed, so that the area within matches the water levels uh, within the lock so that the water levels in the lock match those on the side of the front door then the front door is open and the ship travels on as you might imagine canals are pieces of infrastructure that require routine maintenance to remain useful and we can think of a canal as one example of collective infrastructure that's common to complex societies. So, you know, Mesopotamia, a few thousand, three, four thousand years ago, had canals. Uh, Egyptians built canals uh, to move stone blocks, somewhat short canals. China, various Chinese dynasties have been responsible for creating and maintaining canal systems for thousands of years. So canals aren't particularly new, but for canals, especially shipping canals, uh, to function or to be maintained might be a better way to think of it. They, are, they usually are an indicator of a relatively complex, centralized, and probably you might say somewhat hierarchical society so that resources can be devoted to first building the things and then maintaining them. So we can think in that way as, or in that way, canals, we can think of as kinds of artifacts that are kind of signal to us how complex a society is. And if you're from Niagara, you're probably already aware of canals because in Niagara, there is the Welland Canal, which is much larger than the canals in existence around and running through what's called the Trent Severn waterway uh, around Peterborough. What's interesting though is that the original Welland Canal, I think now we're on the fourth one, that when the Welland Canal, the first Welland Canal was begun around 
sometime in the 1820s, if I recall correctly. This is around the same time that Peterborough also and the surrounding areas also start to develop canals. At this point, you should probably ask yourself, why do we care? So who cares about canals? There's a couple of reasons people care about canals. So one aspect of canals is that they can be thought of as a form of a distant shrinking technology, as we might call it in geography. So canals are especially useful for shipping bulk goods because they, they just make it relatively inexpensive to ship bulk goods like timber or iron ore or heaven forbid even things like sand or gravel they make it relatively inexpensive to ship bulky items so canals reduce transportation costs they often also actually speed up shipping relative to other substitute uh, travel technologies at least up until relatively recently so up until the last 150 years or so so before railroads canals were the main way the bulk goods so things like timber or grains or other agricultural products or iron ore or coal they were canals were the main way that these kinds of bulk goods were transported to market so if we look at the uh, industrial revolution that began it depends on who you ask but certainly by the 1800s the united kingdom was in the throes of an industrial revolution at least the early stages of it and part of what helped drive down costs of industrial goods was a, a well maintained and complex system of canals that were used to transport iron ore and coal, but also other kinds of goods like wool, or later on cotton, uh, to factories that were so important in the first industrial revolution in the United Kingdom. So in, in the European context, we see this as well, uh, like. 20, 30, 40, 50 years later, that canals are still being used so, to transport these kinds of things. So often canals can be thought of as a necessary uh, precondition to an industrial revolution or industrial production. And even today, the fact that the Welland Canal is well-maintained points to the utility of canals in shipping bulk goods because frankly if the welland canal wasn't very useful it wouldn't be maintained in the to the degree that it is now or at all because it is expensive to maintain canals additionally sort of being located alongside a canal maybe not so much nowadays but before electricity or electrical power generation became widespread, being located alongside a canal and especially being near a lock provided a couple of different benefits. So if you owned that land, then the value of the land increased because you, and especially if you were near a lock, that meant that you could then uh, build or you could sell your land to someone who wanted to build ship repair, repair facilities on that land or a warehouse for storing goods uh, or in some cases if it was sort of the stopping point for the day along the canal uh, things like inns or taverns or other kinds of stores to, to provide food or lodging to people so so there's this opportunity for land speculation and in the history of the canals that run through Peterborough County and more generally the Trent Severn Waterway, which is part of that canal system, you've, if you read back 
into the 1830s, the 1840s, that you see that lots of canal uh, building was associated with hopes for land speculation. So that the people who were deciding where to build the canals were also trying to build canals along pieces of land that they actually owned in hopes that they were hoping then that they could sell it off. So there's so land speculators care about canals, but then also people that run factories or need power for machines are also interested in canals because canals will still tend to have either a slight incline or they'll have a slight incline so they'll have a bit of a slope and especially if you locate near a lock the fact that the water has to move through uh, from a higher to a lower location uh, that creates a, a natural power source that can be used to power water wheels to drive various kinds of machines and then in theory with the invention of electric turbines you could also use canals to power electric turbines but frankly that's often more of the case with the dams than actually canals that a dam will provide a better constant source of power for an electric turbine than will a canal anyway so this kind of the second use of canals is that in addition to transportation is that they were often a source of power and as a result of that then you'll see manufacturing uh, economies manufacturing activities set up close to or basically adjacent to alongside canals and a third point and i suspect this might have actually been the original uh, purpose of canals long ago is that they can be used for flood control purposes in in a related fashion for irrigation so with flood control that basically what this means is that you can use the canal to drain the water away from an area so to help make swamps less swampy uh, but also to provide sort of a, a waterway that other people could tap into farmers could tap into to irrigate their crops so these are some of the reasons why we tend to care about canals at least historically in the case of Peterborough and the surrounding areas, it has been influenced by what is now called the Trent Severn Waterway. So here's a quote that I found that I think does a good job of describing this. So it says that it uh, completed in 1920 after 87 years of sporadic construction, the 386 kilometer waterway connects lakes and rivers to make a navigable passage between Georgian Bay which is basically is a chunk of kind of uh, Lake Huron and Lake Ontario. So it allows this connection between Lake Huron and Lake Ontario. And so by extension, this opens up a, a connection to the rest of the navigable world. That is the rest of the world that is on a waterway or ocean. The system includes 36 conventional boat locks, two twin level or flight locks, and 53 kilometers of excavated canals. So these excavated canals are canals that are connecting lakes. And there's the source briefly. So if you want to look a bit more into that. So this gives you a sense of the Trent Severn Waterway. Uh, so it wasn't actually completed until 1920, but had been in existence for close to 90 years before that. So since sometime in the 1830s. Here is a map that shows not just the Trent Severn Waterway. I get a little pointy bit here. So there's the Trent Severn Waterway. And there's Peterborough, right? Right there. And we can see how it connects Lake Huron to Lake Ontario. But this map also shows three other important canal systems that were dug 
in uh, beginning in the 1800s. So this Rideau Canal that connects uh, Lake Ontario to Ottawa. And then from there, there's a river system that connects from Ottawa to Montreal. Around Montreal, we see Canal Le Chine, I believe is how it's pronounced. So a canal system which I don't know very much about, but you're welcome to look up. And then there's also uh, Canal Chamblay, which connects the this whole area here where it's yellow. It's the St. Lawrence Seaway right here. St. Lawrence Seaway connects this. St. Lawrence Seaway is connected to, through Canal Chamblay, into Lake Champlain, which uh, is largely but not completely in New York State. And then from there, Lake Champlain, this sort of yellow line here, so this is still in the United States, right? That yellow line down here is the Hudson River, which then allows shipping from the St. what's now the St. Lawrence Seaway, so the St. Lawrence River, allows shipping from there down to New York City as well. So, the Trent Severn Waterway is one of a series of what were initially commercial canals uh, designed to help sh ship bulk goods from the interior to Canada into the larger, uh, not just like, the main cities in Canada. So, especially in the 1800s, Montreal was the dominant city for all of Canada. So these, this allowed materials to be shipped not from the interior of Canada to Montreal, as well as other locations along the Great Lakes, but also through this waterway over here. So what we now think of as the St. Lawrence Seaway or the St. Lawrence River, this then connects into a larger Atlantic economy, uh, which was, was the dominant economy uh, in the 1800s and for most, if not all, of the 1900s. Nowadays, this Trent Severn waterway, because it's fairly narrow and because of innovations in railroads, as well as in the last hundred years, innovations around automobiles and how, the way that automobiles have it affected transportation. The Trent Severn Waterway doesn't have any commercial uses for shipping. It's now mainly a tourist attraction. So what this means for Peterborough is that it, Peterborough's location adjacent to the Trent Severn Waterway provides businesses in Peterborough opportunities to profit from, benefit from, or interact with people engaged in canal-related tourism. And I will call it a day here. Okay.